to the farm. I'm heading up to Ashland to meet some farmers from the Bayfield Food Co-op. I'm gonna bike from farm to farm to pick up some ingredients for a cream can supper. But first, I'm gonna find out about some new technology that might help me out here on the farm. Gather with us around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Good morning, girls. I'm Inga, and I love everything about farming. Midwestern farms are a bounty of good food made by good people. I love being able to travel to search out good ingredients. Cooking is all about what's seasonal, what's fresh. Every day can be filled with good food, good friends, and a beautiful herd of cows. Welcome to the farm. Good girl. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Quick Trip, Big on Fresh, and proud to support Wisconsin's farmers. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. American Provenance, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television. Thanks for coming out to the farm today. Uh, I'm always interested in new technology and ways that it can help me here on my farm. Tell me a little bit about what technology you're bringing to the farm today. Yeah, the technology that we're bringing to the farm today is drones. And while there's a lot of controversy associated with drones, drones can be of great use in a variety of facets in our lives today. And one of the ways that drones can really help out in agriculture is their ability to what I like to describe as being able to fly low and slow. And when you can fly that drone low and slow, you're able to gather imagery with an incredible amount of detail. And that incredible amount of detail means that you can find out where you have specific areas of problems in your crops. And when we start putting cameras on there that can see what we can't see, such as near infrared, which really measures how much health a plant has, mm -hmm. we can start using that imagery and start making decisions ourselves on how to better manage our agricultural operations. And this technology is cheap enough and readily available enough to where you, as the smaller grower, are able to do stuff that before was really limited to very big science projects and very big operations. Well, this is really exciting, and you brought Pete with you. He's a licensed pilot, and so if you're doing this commercially, you really have to have that pilot's license. Pete has a 107 license, which means he's able to fly commercially. He has all of the insurance needed, and he has an amazing aviation background. He has over 2,000 hours in the cockpit of a Black Hawk helicopter. Wow, that's so Two exciting. Two overseas deployments. Oh my goodness. Well, this is incredible. Folks, I'm gonna go out and find out the health of my pastures and the health of my garden, and then I'm gonna get changed and meet you all up in Ashland to view some other farms and find out about the Bayfield Food Co-op. up to Ashland, let's head over to Freehand Farm, the first stop on our journey. Good morning, Michelle. Well, hi, Inga. It's nice to see you today. Boy, you've got a lot going on. You've got the farm to table restaurant here. You're growing food for your uh, restaurants. You got the restaurant in town. I'm so excited you're taking time out of your busy schedule to do this oh, with me. Thank you, no problem. <laughs> so farm to table is something I know that's really important to you. What does farm to table mean to you? Well, it means bringing food directly from a farm right to the table. Um, and that is what we do here. We, we source from about 15 to 25 different farms, including the Bayfield Cooperative. Mm -hmm. Is farm to table important to you because of the, the freshness of the produce or is it the philosophy behind it? It's both, really. Um, the freshness, definitely, you know, it's so so much fun to, to have things that are literally just right off the vine and with the chefs that we have preparing it, it it's amazing. It's, um, you know, food doesn't usually taste like that. Uh -huh. um, but it's also the philosophy. Um, you know, everyone up here strives to, to be doing the right thing in um, sustainable agriculture is really a practice that everybody follows and there's a lot of things that that means but um, to me it means to enhance the environmental quality and the natural resource base mm -hmm. 
and it also means to enhance the quality of life for the farmers and society as a whole. Well, that's wonderful. Well, I think speaking from a farmer's point of view, it's nice to have folks like you that are willing to purchase our products so that we can tend our land and, and really put in the work that we want to do with our land. And you appreciate that. You pre and it's a full cycle. And it's just, it um, I'm hoping that there's going to be more people like you. Well, thank you. So I'm excited. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> I'm excited to have our celebration this afternoon. Uh, but first, I'm going to head off to Northland College to find out how they're doing sustainability and farm to table eating. Great to be up here with you at Northland College. I'm doing a little bit of the Bayfield Food Co-op Tour today, mm -hmm. and I wanted to stop here and talk to you because I know that you're a farmer and a member of the co-op, but I know the co-op also uh, sells food here at the college, mm -hmm. and local food is a huge part of Northland College. It truly really is. So in your kitchen, you're focusing on just, is it mostly just that preserving the, the local right. foods for that winter season? The college has a goal of 80% local food um, in our food service program. And in order to achieve that goal, we identified we had to build a food preservation kitchen space dedicated just to that so that in our short growing season in far northern Wisconsin, yeah, you guys we are could up capture here. the yeah. local food when it's available and fresh and get it in the freezer and um, have it available in January through May. And this is something that's not only important to the staff, but obviously it's important to the students too. Mm -hmm. They have to be dedicated really to kind of help carry this through because I'm assuming that they're the ones in there helping put up the food and, and get everything done. Yes, yep, so they have a great number of opportunities, um, not only in the kitchen, working on um, you know, preserving the food, canning and freezing, dehydrating, um, but also within the compost um, program as well, which we're expanding out um, outside of campus and actually doing community collection oh, um, in nice. this coming year as well. And then in our campus gardens as well. So we have two campus gardens here at, at the college. And one you actually go to the farmer's market with the produce. Is that, yeah. did it, so they see that? Yeah. Roughly a quarter acre market garden that the students almost 100% run themselves, all the crop planning and seed starting and you know harvesting. And yeah, they go down to the Ashland Farmer's Market every Saturday. It's yep. so nice to hear about I guess I call them kids, they're not kids anymore, but mm -hmm. that they're working and they're, they're yeah. digging in that soil and because it's going to stay with them for the, the rest of their lives. I mean, you and I are both dairy farm kids, yeah. so we have that kind of ingrained in our spirits, right. but it's yep. nice to know uh, that these folks who didn't have maybe the same upbringing is, well, I, I don't think we get a choice. We had to go out there <laughs> exactly. and do it, but right. uh, the, to instill that love and, and also just uh, to show them about local food and how they can eat it year round. Right. I'm, I'm amazed that you can eat year round in uh, Wisconsin because it really is. It's like 10 minutes of warm weather and then forget it. And that's it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you really got to be on the ball. And it's great, actually, too, um, being that we're an institution, um, to s look forward to teaching those techniques, right? Mm -hmm. Here, how to be a successful um, business person and farmer, and that farming is a viable profession. Yeah. Truly. Now, how does it work for you? I mean, you're farming. Is it nice to have this co-op? Is it nice to know that your food is going to a place like Northland College? It's, it's, it must be nice to work full circle, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's great to work in the diversity um, of producers that we have. So it's a 28 member farm, farmer member cooperative. Um, and we have everything from vegetables, fruit, all the meats you could think of possible, even fish fresh out of Lake Superior, right? And so what that does is, um, there's power in numbers. We're able to go out and open up new markets. So we, we provide centralized aggregation, um, one-stop shopping, right? And then they have they, a laundry list of products that they can choose from. They have one place to order from and one truck that shows up at their door. That's so nice. And so that's what's worked really good with Northland College six years ago when we came to talk to them. What do you use for your compost material? Yeah, so we do have a campus-wide uh, compost collection. So not only the cafeteria do we collect everything out of the kitchen, but out of um, people's plate waste but also out of all of the residency halls as well. That's and amazing. That the students actually do that. So they go around nightly and collect all the buckets and bring them to the center and empty and 
That yeah, is exciting to hear yeah, about. It's pretty cool. Well, it's, I wish so, there was more places, or more co-ops like this around the state of Wisconsin because mm -hmm. I know as farmers, it's hard to do everything. It is. Uh, and still yeah. be able to take a deep breath and, and get some sleep at yeah. night. So. Right. <laughs> yep, and if you have one crop that fails, there's usually somebody there to back you up. Yeah. Um, so we can really build consumer confidence as well. Well, Todd, I'm going to let you get back to work. I'm going to go visit some of the other co-op okay. members. But we're going to celebrate the co-op today with uh, a little cream can dinner so uh, I'll that let you know delicious. what that's gonna be like later on Great. Okay. <laughs> well why don't we continue on our co-op trip but we're gonna go pick up some mead I've made it to white winter winery to learn all about mead hey John hey Inga thanks for coming you're right on time well let's go check it out all right come on in we'll get started John, this is so fun to finally see your tasting room and be able to visit you here where you make your mead. We are very excited to have you. Thanks for coming over. So for those people who don't know, are not familiar with mead, can you kind of explain what it is? Sure, in its purest form, mead is simply honey, water, and yeast fermented out. Then we have several different other styles called a melomel, which are made with fruit, mm -hmm. a sizer, which is uh, made with fresh pressed apple cider and honey, uh, other products we make here are cider, hard ciders, and spirits as well. Oh, nice. And mead, this is, mead is one of the oldest forms of alcohol, right, in the yeah. world or something? Yeah, it's rumored to be actually be the oldest form of alcohol or fermented beverage in the world. Um, and it, we think it predates wine and beer making by several thousand years at least. What's some of the folklore behind it? Well, the big one is that it's the traditional drink of the honeymoon, so the newlywed couple was given a moon supply of mead to ensure a fruitful union, and it was thought that the sweeter the mead, the more fruitful the union would be. And your product is really a Wisconsin product. The honey is coming from here, the berries are coming from here. That's really a unique thing. Yeah, we do our best to try and use as much locally produced fruits and honey as we possibly can, and we're about 80% successful with that now, uh, coming from within about 150 miles or less of the store. That's amazing. Now, honey is the main ingredient. So do you like, there's so many different honeys. So there's like a buckwheat honey, wildflower, yeah. clover. What do you use? Does it matter what you're using? Absolutely, it matters. Honey uh, is the key ingredient. So we want to make sure we're getting the best, the finest that we can possibly get. Um, we use typically a real early season Dutch white clover and basswood honey in the traditional meads, which again are just the honey and water, so that honey is very much forward. So we want to make sure we're getting the, just a nice, light, real representative flavor of Wisconsin in that particular product. Then we'll use a later season, what I consider kind of a mixed wildflower blend, uh, for the styles of mead that use fruit, that and that honey has, a, it's a little bit darker, has a little more of that characteristic honey flavor to it mm -hmm. that stands up against that fruit a little bit better. So your product must change from year to year because the honey is going to change from year to year, right? Yes, that's exactly right. There's and always little nuances of flavor and differences. That's one thing I love about these artisan products here is that it's going to change a little bit and it's going to be a little bit different and that's what makes it special. It's not some sort of factory, everything's going to be the same and mm -hmm. everything, the quality has to be the same every time. It's a little bit different. Yeah, that's exactly right. We're not trying to make a commodity product. We're trying to make a product that's uh, very uh, representative of who we are and what we are here in this region. And that's the essence of craft. Up here, it's incredible. You guys have the Bayfield Co-op, and you're a part of that co-op, right? Uh, it's a real synergistic relationship. We buy fruits from members of the co-op, um, and they sell our products in the CSA. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I'm planning on having a little community uh, dinner for the people in the co-op later on this afternoon. Do you think you can join us? I would love to, as long as you're going to help us finish off the bottling in the back. Absolutely. OK. I'm going to help John finish up here, and then we're going to head over to Great Oak Farm to pick up some vegetables from Chris. I'll see you there. ride out here to Great Oaks Farm here in Mason, Wisconsin. I'm going to go see if Chris will take a minute away from cultivating to show us around the farm. Hey Chris. 
Hey, Inga. Well, hey, I was sent over here to gather some ingredients for the party that we're having later on. Do you have any tomatoes that are ripe this time of the year? We got a whole hoop house full of them. This will be my first tomatoes of the season, so I'm very oh, excited. You're in for a treat. Let's go check them out. Okay. Tomatoes look beautiful, it's amazing in here. <laughs> Thanks. You're involved with the co-op. How has the co-op helped you here with your operation on the farm? Our Bayfield Foods Cooperative has uh, really helped kind of streamline our marketing, I think. And um, it, it, it's, it's really been um, great because as a producer, I can focus on production here, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we sort of collaborate on the marketing. Yeah, I don't have to be um, out in the field and answering questions about uh, from our CSA members or wholesale, you know, buyers or whatever. Um, we we sort of have that streamlined. Yeah, that's nice because I know, it, you know, with farming, you you have to wear so many different hats, and right. the the less you can spread yourself thin, having to do everything, the better job you can actually do working on the farm. Yeah, well, an, another great benefit has been um, sort of from an infrastructure perspective. We um, instead of us having to have a you know refrigerated transportation vehicle and each of the other twenty producers in the co-op having a refrigerated transportation vehicle and doing a delivery every week and you know paying a driver etc we can have one person do all that we, we pull our resources and have our own we have one refrigerated um, van and a refrigerated trailer if we need more space so then every week we can all bring our our, our produce and meat and you know you name it um, to one place and the delivery driver picks it up and um, takes it on the route so yeah that lets us stay back and do what we do best but also um, lets us have some time to spend with our families at the end of the yeah. day instead of just being in the truck so. and just constantly working working right. working working right? right well I hope the idea catches on around Wisconsin I think it's a great idea you don't come from a farming background. Yeah, my um, my grandparents had a farm um, in West Virginia. It was kind of your traditional um, livestock and row crop farm. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, when I was a kid, I always thought, boy, it sure would be nice to be a be a farmer when I grow up. Um, but all the farmers I knew were gray hair and you know old guys. So I thought that's just what people did when they retired. So um, then when I was at, at Northland uh, College, I did an internship in the summertime at a fruit and berry farm up in Bayfield, and um, that was sort of when the light bulb turned on and that kind of the seed that was planted when I was a little kid running around in my grandparents farm finally germinated and I realized wow if, if we're really going to do this this local original food production thing um, we need to do it before we're ready to retire <laughs> so yeah then um, when I got out of college that was the first thing I really sat down to, to get established. It seems like with the vegetable and the fruit side of farming there's a lot of younger people coming into it a lot of more you know folks around our age kind of coming into it and making it happen and it's exciting to see it is yeah yeah it's it's encouraging you know yeah, to encouraging. sort of see the next generation coming on yeah well they say right now I think the statistic is uh, the average age of a farmer in the United States is I think 64 or 65 wow. so it's nice to see well I still consider myself young I still yeah, think I'm 18 right, you know, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I got a few more years to go before I'm the average age so I guess I'm doing all right <laughs> well good well do you see yourself growing here on the farm or mm. adding uh, different different animals or anything like that or is is this working for you right yeah I think um, I I really enjoy doing the vegetables and I actually started off doing a lot more livestock and um, then that sort of twice a day everyday routine it, it was good for a while but then when my wife and I started having a family and kids were in school and doing after-school activities it you know it's, tough. yeah it was just a lot to juggle so I really like the vegetables that um, they'll be okay if I sneak off and go camping for a weekend with the family um, um, you know, the tomatoes will still be here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, I'm going to let you get back to work, and I'm going to get some dinner on. So do you mind if I grab some carrots on the way out? Oh, yeah, sure. They're right down the hill. Well, I'm going to grab the carrots, and then why don't we get on back to make our cream can supper? Today we're cooking up a cream can dinner. I'm excited that you can use these cream cans for something other than just milk and cows. It's an old fashioned recipe that would happen on a lot of Midwestern farms when there was a lot going on, a lot of people coming over uh, for a meal. It's a great way to cook for a crowd and we've got a crowd to cook for today. So I'm gonna get started. 
What we're going to be doing is we're going to be steaming all these vegetables that we've collected up here in Ashland. And it's a nice recipe for a hot sunny day because I can stick it into the steamer and get out of here because I'm steaming up here myself. So the first thing that you do, since we are steaming, we don't want the vegetables to just hit the bottom of the pan. So in the old days, they would use clean stones, but I find using uh, these canning lids to be a, a fine substitute for stones. And these will allow the vegetables to lift off the bottom of the cream can and allowing the steam to move around. So line the bottom of the can with your lids. The next layer, some cabbage. Now I've cut them nice and thick because this is gonna be the beginning layer of our vegetables and it'll allow the other vegetables to kind of have a place to sit on top of. Next, we're gonna add some corn. Summer is the greatest time of the year because you can get fresh corn. My grandmother's thing back on our farm was corn. She liked to grow a lot of sweet corn and she would set up this whole production line in our shop. We'd take the tractors out of the shop. She'd put all kinds of tables in there. We had a huge stove in there and she had all of us, uh, we'd have to go out and pick the corn, shuck the corn, and then we'd toss it into these big boiling vats of water, take it out, and then we'd just cut it right off the cob there and freeze it. And then we'd eat frozen cream corn at every single meal throughout the winter time. But I still love it and I still think it was a good idea that she got all of us together to help feed the family over the winter time. What I'm gonna do with the corn here is cut them into little coins. Maybe, you know what, I'm not. They're gonna be too hard to cut. And that's how you have to cook. You have to, if you can't cut them, you just cut them in half like that. Next is gonna be the onions. I want them to be in wedges. So what I mean by that is that I'm just gonna sort of leave the onion intact at the bottom here, and that'll help hold the onion together. So it'll just be in a little wedge. This recipe, like most of the things I cook, is very versatile. You can use whatever you have on hand if you wanna throw some squash in or some sweet potatoes, that'd be fine too. Anything that you have in the garden, you can put a lot of fresh herbs in this. Some fennel might be nice if you're into fennel. So like with everything I cook, I just like to use my imagination. And this will be a nice aromatic that we're working with here. And the next thing we're gonna add is some of Chris's carrots. Carrots and onions, you can't go wrong with that. This is kind of a summertime stew. I suppose you could always do it in the fall too and just warm your hands over the steam of the milk can, but it's a nice thing to do in the summertime. And then in they go. And next goes in the potatoes. They're a new potato, they're a smaller variety, so they, I don't need to cut them up. If you're gonna use a bigger potato, then you wanna quarter them or half them at least so that they all cook correctly with the same time as all the other vegetables. I kept one potato out to put on top and this is how I'm gonna check to see if the stew is done. Next, I brought with me some garlic from my farm. So this variety of garlic I have here is a hardneck variety and that grows really well in Wisconsin. It's a good for cold weather climates and that's why I chose it for my garden. And with this, I'm just gonna take off the outer skins. And I love this garlic. I love the beautiful purple streaks that it has in it. And it's kind of an all purpose. It's good for everything. The next thing you're gonna add to this is some brats. Now I've pre-grilled the brats a little bit. That's to get the juices coming out of them and get everything flowing and to add the flavor. And I'm putting them on top of all the other vegetables so that the juices from the brats can flow down and sink into everything. So I'm gonna quarter these up. Mm, they smell delicious. And these are a local brat from a right up here in Ashland. This is a very Ashland meal. So the sausages go right in the pot here. All right. Season it with a little salt and pepper and if you wanna add some other herbs like rosemary and thyme would be fantastic in here. And then finally, our steaming liquid is gonna be beer. If you don't wanna use beer, you can use water, that's fine, but the beer adds a little bit more flavor. and our potato for the top. Now I'll just put the top back on the can. I'm gonna light up my torch. Once this gets steaming, I'm gonna put a timer on and a half an hour after it starts steaming, 30 to 40 minutes, it'll be ready for us to eat. 
Looks like the potato's done. We're ready to go. A starter of colorful, local heirloom tomatoes with a dash of balsamic vinaigrette. A special honey mead made just up the road. It's the perfect summer libation. A plethora of Northwoods veggies and local brats steamed in a cream can. A perfect Wisconsin supper with farm friends. A yummy dessert, flaky homemade kringle smothered with a Bayfield berry compote. Well, I hope this has inspired you to come up to Ashland and meet all of these wonderful farmers. And I hope you'll gather with us next time around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>